the atmosphere of seclusion we have here is really conducive to the practice. Even though the seclusion is not total, we're not living in silence. Still the basic values are conducive to looking into your own mind, because that's the, the bottom line here. Each of us is training his or her own mind. And so we don't feel strange or out of place. The values here point inward. And that set of values is as important as the physical seclusion. The problem when you're not here, how do you maintain those values? Because you can't take the, the physical atmosphere of the monastery with you. What you can take with you, though, are the skills that you've been learning here. How to focus on the mind, how to focus on the breath, how to allow the breath to be comfortable. And not just the in and out breath, but the breath energy throughout the body. That's an important skill right there. It gives you a link to what you've been doing here. And these are skills that are useful not only when you're sitting here with your eyes closed or doing walking meditation. They're useful all the time when you're in difficult situations. You can still work with the breath. And at the very least, it gives you a sense of having your space when other people seem to be invading your space. And having your own little fortress inside. And at the same time, the energy of the breath can form a shield. Because when your awareness fills the body, good breath energy fills the body, it's very difficult for other people's energy to penetrate, to invade. All too often we leave huge gaps, huge sections of the body that are undefended, and other people will invade them. We pick up their moods, we pick up their attitudes, and then it's hard to shake them off. But as you fill the body with your awareness, have breath energy flowing throughout the different parts of the body. You feel at ease, and you're also protected. The image the Buddha gives is of a door made of hardwood. Someone throws a ball of string at the door. It doesn't penetrate the door at all. Most people's minds, he said, are like clay. When people throw a stone into the clay, it makes a huge impression. So it's just one of the skills you can take with you. But it's also important that you learn how to protect your values. Here in the West we have a problem that the society doesn't even give lip service to Buddhist values. And so it's almost like we're aliens, surrounded by people who don't understand us. If you go to Thailand, it's not that much different. People do give lip service to Buddhism, but in the society in general, you don't have to scratch very deep to find a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of values go contrary to what the Buddha taught. Really being serious about the practice is a countercultural thing. So you have to be very careful about what you pick up from your surroundings. This is where restraint of the senses comes in. The things you look at, the things you listen to. You have to ask yourself, why am I looking? Why am I listening? What am I getting out of the looking and the listening? Of course, in some cases, things are right in your face, especially when there are people around you. But again, you want to protect your sense of your own personal space.
and when you're not feeling invaded by the other people, it's a lot easier to step back and just look at their attitudes as being their attitudes, and not necessarily something you have to pick up. And so the sense of stepping outside of the culture is a necessary part of the practice. And of course, you look at our culture, there's a lot of neurosis, a lot of other problems that you really do want to step outside of, you don't want to be part of. So as a John Fuang used to counsel his students, okay, okay, your body's in the world, but your mind doesn't have to be in the world. Your mind can stay with the Dharma. And although it may be disconcerting at first to have that sense of separation, you find that it is for your own true health, your own true happiness. So just as when you're meditating, a thought comes up and you say, well, is that so? Is that so? You ask the same thing of other people. In fact, if you can't ask that thought, of course you don't ask it right out loud. You ask it, pose the question in your mind. To what extent is that so? And if you can't do that with other people, there's no way you can do it with your own mind. You start accepting their ideas, well, it's going to be very hard not to accept your own ideas, your own attitudes, or the things you've internalized. And John Lee's advice for any insight that comes up in the meditation was to ask yourself, to what extent is the opposite true? That way you can step back from the thoughts, anything that really impresses itself on your mind. And you can practice the same, same attitude to the things other people tell you or the things other people insist on. There may be some truth to what they say. But it's good to step back and gauge how far does that truth go. Because in the Buddha's words, some truths are categorical. I mean, they're true across the board for everybody. And other truths are personal. I mean, may they be true for that one particular person, but they don't have to be true for you. And what we're looking for here as we practice is that insight into things that are true across the board. The Buddha's teaching on skillfulness, his explanation of how suffering is caused and how it can be put to an end. These things are constant. They don't depend on the culture. They don't depend on the time or place. So you start by holding to that. You try to keep your precepts pure, keep your views straight, in other words, understanding what causes suffering and what doesn't. And that right there offers you a lot of protection. These three principles fall under another set of five that the Buddha taught to new monks. The other two are keeping control over your mouth, trying to have restraint in what you say. Do your best not to get entangled. And again, when you can keep restraint over your mouth, it's a lot easier to keep restraint over the mind. Then the fifth quality is trying to find some seclusion, having time for yourself, so you're not constantly surrounded by other people and their attitudes, so that you're stepping out physically and mentally from the general current of thought. At home, this may mean having just a little corner in where you live that when you go into that corner, all you do is meditate. Or it can mean actually going out and finding some time out in nature to help clean out the mind, 
and gain some perspective on the issues of the day, the issues at work, the issues at home, the issues in the family. This is a universal antidote to our general immersion in society. We've all noticed that when you get out and you're alone in nature, you start thinking about a lot of the issues back home, a lot of the issues at work, and they seem so small and so petty. The Buddha talks about this. He says you got get out in nature and when the perception of wilderness overcomes you, that you're alone in nature, and nature has nothing and at all to do with what's in society. All the perceptions and concepts of people back home and the issues back home. They seem small and far away, and it's good to have the mind in that space as often as possible, so it can really turn around and look at itself. So you can realize the extent to which you're still carrying suffering around is right there in the mind. And if you're busy with other people's issues, it's very hard to look at your own. The sphere in which you really are causing yourself unnecessary suffering, and there's an opportunity to see it happen, and there's an alternative. You don't have to do that. You'll get some perspective on which thoughts coming into the mind are useful and which ones are actually defilements. As we're in your in society, it's very easy to get defensive about your opinions, your ideas, especially when they're under attack. And your ideas seem to be the only thing that you can hold on to, to have a sense of your own independence, a sense of your own not just giving in to other people. This is why in the context of society it's very hard to give up your ideas, because it's like you're giving in to somebody else. Whereas if you can step outside those concerns, that context, it's easier to be more objective. When you see an idea come up, and it's not an issue of whether it's your idea versus someone else's idea, but simply this idea appearing in the mind. And then you can actually watch what it's doing to the mind. Where is it adding a burden? Where is it adding stress? And you would look at this again and again and again until you find that you're tired of the whole thing. Not tired of the meditation, tired of these ideas that weigh down the mind. So realize you don't want to keep feeding on them. The word nibita, disenchantment, is also the, the word for feeling revulsion at a certain kind of food. You've been eating it for a long time and then you suddenly realize this is garbage. This is something that I don't want to feed on ever again. The Buddha talks about an enticing beverage. Tastes good, looks good, and you keep wanting to drink it until you suddenly realize there's poison in the beverage. And then no matter how good it tastes or how good it looks, that knowledge that is poisonous is enough to develop a sense of nibida. That's the same attitude you want to take towards your defilements, your greed, your aversion, your delusion. This is another reason why it's good to have the breath as your defense against other people, because so many times we keep our defilements up as our armor to protect ourselves, or we think we protect ourselves from others staking out our place with our anger, staking out our place with this aggressive attitude. And so we're unwilling to let it go, because we think without those attitudes we'd be defenseless. But now that we've got other defenses, the shield of your energy, the shield of your concentration, You're actually better equipped 
because no matter how good your armor can be, there will always be a spear someplace that you can use to pierce the armor. But with the shield of the concentration, the shield of the, the breath, things go right through, but it doesn't touch anything inside. This is another reason why it's good to have the breath as your defense, because nobody can even see what it is. They don't know where to, where to deal with it. It's just you know inside. You've got this protection. So this is why it's useful, even when you're at home, is to try to find some quiet time just to be by yourself so the mind can take care of itself. watch itself without issues of other people getting in the way. So when you leave the monastery, remember, you're taking skills with you. And these are skills necessary for life, i.e. the life of the mind's goodness, the life of the mind's awareness. the life of its potential for freedom. So don't forget to pack those skills with you when you go.